everyone can hear me. And welcome. It's great to see, um, great to see such a, a turnout. My, the approach that I am going to take uh, in the next 15 minutes or so is unashamedly a view from an ethical view, a view from the BMA's ethics department. I've been involved um, for many years now, writing guidance, giving talks, exploring ethical and legal issues that arise in relationship to the care and treatment of adults who may have some cognitive impairment, or in this context, may be, there may be safeguarding concerns around them. Now, this area of practice presents some fairly unique ethical or moral problems and questions. Um, what I thought I would start off with is this quote from the United, Nation Con not United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Now, this is not binding statute in the UK. It's a UN convention. But it does give a kind of direction of travel. And what this says is, states, parties, don't worry about that, that's just kind of legalese, that means, say, for example, the United Kingdom, shall prohibit all, big phrase, all discrimination on the basis of disability and guarantee to persons with disabilities equal and effective legal protection against discrimination on all grounds. There is a classic piece of convention, almost rhetoric, if you like. It's a very powerful statement, but for our context, what this means is anybody with any kind of mental or cognitive disability is guaranteed equal rights. In our context, again, that also means at issue are the question of the rights of people who may have some cognitive impairment. So what does a non-discriminatory approach look like? Well, it seems to me here you've got a tension. And this is the tension, in my view, that tracks all the way through. This is the moral tension and it is also comes out as a legal tension because the law is trying to get the contours of the ethical problems here. There is a, con a tension here between, the, between what you might want to call right of non-interference. That is to say, all adults in the UK are presumed to have the liberty to make decisions about their lives. It's a very strong right, jealously defended in English law. The rights of adults, <coughs> competent adults particularly, to make decisions about their own lives. Any of you familiar with ethical principles in medicine? It's cashed out as the principle of autonomy or self-government, if you like. But when we're talking about vulnerable adults, we come up against another kind of right, which is the right to certain kinds of protection and support. And it is, it seems to me, ethically and legally tracking away through those rights in relation to adults that generates so many of the challenges in this area of practice. So that really is how I want to frame this brief introduction to this area. Okay. We have a definition. It's inevitably going to be approximate 
A vulnerable adult is somebody who's 18 or over, so lawfully, yes, an adult, who is or may be, we, those extraordinarily accommodating words, is or may be in need of community care, care services by reason of disability, <coughs> age or illness, and is, again, is or may be unable to take care of or unable to protect themselves against significant harm or exploitation. So within that definition there, gather together really the tensions that I'm talking about. The tension, the question around an adult who has the presumptive right to make decisions in relation to his or her life, and also an adult who may be vulnerable to persecution, to exploitation, manipulation, vulnerable to a whole host of harms. And we know as well that this demographic, insofar as it is a demographic, insofar it can be captured by those terms, is growing. We're seeing a greater numbers of people. People live, old, you know, live to far more extended ages these days. There is greater period greater likelihood and possibility that people will experience with ageing, for example, some kinds of cognitive decline. And in some instances, in some instances, an increase in vulnerability. But the term vulnerable adult, in some respects, is contentious. What do we mean? What are we saying about someone to someone if we are defining them as vulnerable. What does that actually mean? And as I put up there, it can involve, and I think this is where we have to be careful in terms of the first of the rights I talked about, the autonomy rights, the liberty rights of ordinary human beings, ordinary adults in the UK. It can involve some assumptions, prejudicial assumptions, about their ability to lead their own lives, and it can lead to certain kinds of discrimination. But on the other hand, of course, if we approach all our adults with an assumption that they are all fully armed with their panoply of rights, and that therefore they should be left alone to do whatever, there are concerns, and this is where the whole adult safeguarding agenda begins to emerge, there are concerns that they may, therefore, be vulnerable to all kinds of, as I said, exploitation. So it's around that, it's around that, as I say, around that tension. When we are calling somebody a vulnerable adult, what are we doing? What are we saying about them? What are we saying to them? Let us at least bring those buried assumptions, insofar as they are buried, let's at least bring them into the foreground so that we're aware of what we're doing. I should say as well that there is going to be time um, for a, for a, um, for a, to ask questions afterwards. But if you've got anything burning to say as I'm, ca as I'm talking, do please, do please stop me and ask. I say I'm not going to talk for, for very long. Okay, so we've talked about, I've talked about this tension this tension in rights, if you like, um, which is more of a legalistic, it's also a tension, if you like, in principle, the principle of autonomy, of respecting adult decision-making freedoms, in tension with the principle of, of, if you like, beneficence, the obligation to do good, which all health pro professionals are clearly under a very strong obligation to do good by those whom they provide services to. But, they, but that tension, one of the ways in which the law works in this area is it introduces the concept of decision-making capacity. Absolutely vital in this area. Because what the law effectively says is that if somebody lacks the capacity to make a specific decision at a specific time, then that decision can be made for them on the basis of an assessment of their best interests. That's what the law said. 
But, and in some respects, I mean, there are all sorts of complex issues around here, but in some respects, if you have an adult who lacks capacity to make a decision, in certain, the door has been legally opened for you to intervene. The issue really becomes, I think, much more challenging where you have adults who are assessed as being potentially vulnerable but retain the capacity to make the decision in question and those decisions seem to lead to or expose them to real risks of harm. And that, it seems to me, is where many of the real moral issues arise. And not just moral issues, because we may come up with a legal answer. It also gives rise to a great deal of anxiety. Because health professionals feel they are under an obligation to do good, the obligation of beneficence, if you like, and yet, by not intervening, by letting adults take the consequences of their own decisions, even in circumstances where there may be all sorts of concerns about coercion, about, you know, they may retain the capacity, the cognitive capacity to make a decision, but what happens if they're being coerced by those around? All sorts of complicated questions, I think, arise here, which is partly what makes this legally and ethically such a challenging area of practice. Okay. So, in terms of the Mental Capacity Act, because that's what, in England and Wales, it's the Mental Capacity Act that governs decision-making in relation to adults lacking capacity. There is, within English law, what is called the presumption of adult capacity. So whenever you are working with an adult, you start off with the presumption that he or she has the capacity to make decisions on their own behalf. In legal language, it's what's called a rebuttable presumption. In certain circumstances, it can be put to one side <coughs> where there is sufficient evidence that he or she lacks the capacity to make decisions. But importantly here, vulnerability is not synonymous with incapacity. And that is the crucial issue, I think. That is, as I said, to repeat, and I'm happy to repeat this because it's such a core tension here. Just because somebody is vulnerable, it doesn't mean to say. It cannot legally be taken to mean that they lack the, uh, the capacity to make a decision. <coughs> and when you assess somebody as lacking the capacity to make a decision, you are doing something very, very powerful. What you are doing, effectively, is saying they no longer have the right to make the decision themselves. That is a very, very powerful intervention in an adult's life, a very, very important <laughs> intervention. And which is why the Mental Capacity Act imposes quite, quite cumbersome obligations on decision makers to try and ensure that adults have the ability, are given the opportunity to, to make and be involved in as many decisions as possible. It's all about, that's all about supportive decision making. So, adults lacking decision making capacity clearly, it seems to me, are potentially very, very vulnerable because they lack the ability, they lack the resources to govern their own lives in certain kinds of circumstances and they are potentially, therefore, extremely vulnerable. But as I've said, where an adult lacks capacity, <coughs> is assessed as lacking capacity, a decision can be made on their own behalf. Any such decision, and one of the great things about the Mental Capacity Act, is it has at its centre a moral compass. What it says is, any decision 
made for or on behalf of an adult lacking capacity has to be made on the basis of an assessment of their best interests. It is their interests that govern decision making about them, not the interests of carers, not the interests of third parties, not the interests of, of, of children or parents or neighbours or... It's the interests, fundamentally, the interests of the adult lacking capacity, and that is the core of it. Okay. One other issue that, that, that is a source of a lot of concerns in this area, I, we, get, we get inquiries at the, at the BMA at work an awful lot about this issue, is the question of confidentiality. The question of sharing information about adults who may be vulnerable. And here, as in terms of decision making generally, the fundamental principle remains the same, which is that adults who have capacity have the right, it is a kind of autonomy right, they have the right to make decisions about whether or not information, their information is shared. So that is again the starting point. Now, the right, an individual's right to confidentiality can be set to one side in certain circumstances. If, for example, it's necessary to disclose information in order to protect a third party, somebody else, from a serious risk of harm, an individual's right to confidentiality can be set to one side. But the circumstances are quite, are quite particular. So when it comes to a vulnerable adult who retains the capacity to make the decision about the transfer, passing on of their information, it's up to them. It is their decision-making right. Similarly, where an adult lacks capacity to make the decision about information sharing, it becomes a best interest decision that can be taken under the, mental, under the powers of the Mental Capacity Act. Information about an adult lacking capacity can be shared where it is, is both necessary to share it and the sharing is in the best interest of the adult. Okay, so I'll finish with a few core principles in relation to safeguarding and then as I said, I'm very happy to take, to take questions. When we're talking about vulnerable adults, empowerment, facilitating, enabling adults to take decisions, to be involved in decision making, particularly decisions in relation to looking after their own interests. Key principle, protection. Yes, if we've got empowerment, which speaks to the freedom right, the liberty right, enabling and supporting people to make decisions to fulfil their autonomy rights, if you like, Protection speaks to the other right, the right to be free from certain kinds of harm. Important principles. Prevention, yes, I think speaks for itself. Proportionality. If you are involved in making decisions in relation to adults lacking capacity or vulnerable adults, interventions, particularly interventions that may restrict an individual's rights, need to be proportionate to the outcome. If there are ways of reaching certain kinds of desired ends that are less restrictive of individual freedom, go that way. That's what the law says. That's also, it seems to me, ethically, um, ethically intuitive. Working in partnership, and yes, finally, transparency and accountability. Making decision, de keeping decisions open, accountable and transparent absolutely vital in this area. So I'll leave it at that as a kind of framing, just to reiterate, it seems to me at the ethical heart here is the tension between liberty rights and the obligation to intervene to a certain extent to protect the interests of adults who are perceived as vulnerable. So I'll leave it at that. I'm very happy to take questions.
say who you are. Yes, my name is Carl Curtis. I'm a nurse. Um, I found your uh, talk very interesting and very explicit, but I wanted to make sure that I'd got um, the understanding correct. And that was, um, I was always to be on their side and act in their best interests. Does that sum up what we are trying to achieve? Yeah, I mean, it would be very, it would be very hard to justify any intervention in the life of a vulnerable adult or specifically an adult lacking capacity to make decisions that was not in their best interests. Why would you, why would you not do that? One of the issues becomes, however, <coughs> where people begin to act in ways, either coerced or freely, begin to act in ways that, from an external perspective, look like they are not in their own best interest. And that's where some of the real tensions emerge here. At what we, all of us, almost all of us, I'm sure, some of the time, do dumb, stupid things. We do things <coughs> that you look back and you think, that was stupid. I kind of wish I hadn't done that. But English law says, you're an adult. You're free to do stupid things. As long as, ordinarily, you're not harming others, if you want to go and do something stupid, off you go. When it comes to decision-making, when people are making decisions where there may be some cognitive problems, there may be some vulnerability, and they're doing things that don't look like they're in their best interest, in certain circumstances, you can go further than giving them advice saying that's a stupid thing to do. You can, in certain circumstances, actually intervene to say, well, look, what you're doing is not objectively in your best interests. You don't have the capacity to make these particular decisions, and therefore, you can intervene. Gentlemen. Well, we're into a mire of great complexity, aren't we? Because we're talking about free will, we're talking about personal agency, we're talking about boundaries, we're talking about all, s all kinds of complex things. Speaking personally, I think it's jolly good that we're here talking about such things, but I'm not sure that an address like this can do it justice. Um, <coughs> In my work as a doctor, I've been doing it for more than four decades now. I'm dealing with this all the time. And how on earth, with each patient to assess what they're capable of, what they're capable of understanding, how much agency they're capable of exerting, is different every time. If I'm talking to somebody who's obese, or a smoker, or a drinker, for example, are they really in charge of what they're doing? Yes. Equally with a very, very anxious uh, mother who uh, brings in her small child whose own mother is dying and who is inordinately anxious about a healthy child, is she really in charge of her own thoughts and emotions? These are the kinds of things that I deal with day in and day out. And the problem is how on earth do we pay attention to those nuanced individual encounters and then mass produce it and make it formulate, which is what this kind of meeting is about. Now, here's a caveat. I think that we run into very little trouble if we have headspace and heart space for imagination and good bonds with people. But if we cannot do that because there is no headspace and no heart space and no time, and no area where we can exert our imagination and good judgment, it doesn't matter how much of this stuff we will have, we will not take the right decisions. And I think what we're talking about here is very much like good family relationships. How do we know, how do we think we know what the other person is capable of taking on in, 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 in their active agency? If we've got a sick partner, we constantly have to adjust ourselves around that, and it changes from day to day, or even minute to minute. 
If we have adolescents, how do we assess what they're capable of taking on for themselves and how much discipline they need? Maybe I've said enough, but that's the kind of complexity we're dealing with, and I think it's very important that we don't get formulaic and too official about it. I mean, that this is... Th 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 I didn't hear a question in there. <laughs> so... That's a statement of belief. <laughs> so, Hello, my name's Leslie Luce. I'm at Elm Lodge Surgery. I'm a practice nurse there. Um, with the increasing sort of dementia and Alzheimer's and vulnerability of adults, um, do you think there should be um, preparation beforehand um, because we don't know who's going to be a vulnerable adult and therefore sometimes you need to get decisions made beforehand. Um, I have a mother who has dementia and we obviously had to go through the end of life care plan and it was very difficult for me but I did it when she had some mental capacity. So therefore I feel that whatever decisions I'm making it is in her best interest. And um, I know from the legal point of view, I've got power of attorney. Um, and, uh, but I just, I just feel that we don't know who are going to be the vulnerable adults. And therefore, whether we should have sort of something in place before. It, 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 it touches on, on the question of anticipatory decision making. So when we are as I consider myself to be now reasonably invulnerable would be an absurd thing, but I'm not aware of any obvious vulnerabilities. Should I start planning now for a time in the future when my, I may become more vulnerable, my capacity, my decision-making capacity might decline? The answer to which is I think that's a very personal question. I do it personally. I make preparatory statements. There is one, and, 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 and therefore, and, and the, the Mental Capacity Act provides legal structures for us to carry over capacitous or autonomous decisions at a time in the future when we may lose capacity. The only, because my background is, eth is in ethics, the only caveat <coughs> that I would place there is that it can be quite difficult to predict in advance how we're going to feel at a time in the future when we, I mean, there was a very, quite a poignant blog, I think it was in the, in the New York Times, I think last week. One doctor, one doctor writing about the death of his father, who was also a doctor. His father was uh, uh, specialized in infectious diseases. He, when he, was a, when, when he was full of life, when he was a practicing physician, he railed against the overuse of of antibiotics when people were obviously dying. He said, these are unnecessary interventions, people are clamoring for them. I refuse to treat, I refuse to do it. And then when he became very old, when he was obviously dying, he started to ask for everything that was available. Difficult, difficult questions, really difficult questions. <coughs> 